Good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon. How are you today? I'm uh, Stephen Ludlow, Vice President of Product Marketing. I'm with me. I'm Michael Chipala, Vice President of Product Engineering and Product Management. Good afternoon. And uh, we're here today to cover a very broad set of things. Obviously, we've got a fair amount of time to do it, but we've tried to make this very interesting for you. So we're going to cover strategy and roadmap. And uh, I had to step back a little bit and decide what I was going to do. And my, all, my thought is always public speaking 101. Know your audience. Okay, so here's my take, at least on the audience, that as, as I see it right now. Um, I would say probably this group over here is likely here due to the idea that they want to they wanna understand what's coming in their products that exist today, how it's going to affect their implementation, just knowing what's, what's new, what's coming. Um, this group over here likely is kind of in, uh, concerned about uh, future-proofing their investment, future-proofing, making sure that um, OpenText has a cloud strategy. I would say probably this group over here, thank you, this group over here, probably realizing that on a day-to-day -day basis, the people that have you know, been responsible for what we would consider ECM before, as we're moving to content services, are being asked to do more and more and expand their view of what content services is and what information management is, these guys. And I think these guys right here, I think they probably thought there was gonna be free candy. But we'll have to see. Okay, so we have we have a, we have an, an agenda based on really those those needs, right? So our agenda is going to cover a whole bunch of stuff, starting with the idea of what what can you do to leverage your existing investment in open text content services today, and we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution to the cloud, and we're also going to have a, a great customer speaker come out as well. Uh, we're going to move from there into this bigger view, right? What's the expanding definition of, of um, content management, content services into information management? And we have a great guest speaker in that we have John Mancini from AIM coming out to, to join us as well. And basically, that's our agenda that, to get going. Oh, sorry, sorry. I got candy, too. Thanks, guys. All right, so enough with the candy. And I thought maybe the, 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 the starting point for us was to, to look at what we know works when it comes to content services. Right, so we're going to provide four strategies for content management success using content services. And the, before we even start on that, I really wanted to, to make emphasize that this idea of content services is about, not about ECM anymore. And why we're making the difference between content services and ECM is that ECM was often looked at as the lead application. Content services is the shift to some consumable services that can be embedded into business process and business applications. And you know, you, you might be asking yourself, why am I taking advice from these two guys on stage? Well, I think we're starting to get it right. Um, from an analyst perspective, from a strategy perspective, they validated that our strategy is right in the way that we're approaching content services. And you know, you don't have to take their advice either. Well, um, analyst validation is great. I think uh, customer validation is even better. Um, so Freeport, for example, is using our solutions for building a multi-billion dollar uh, liquefaction capital project, uh, managing all the engineering documents, and integrating those services also into SAP. But that's just a snippet, you know. Uh, they will have a full presentation talking about uh, their implementation, talking about the value they get uh, from using our solutions. and. Uh, thankfully, we have 26 additional customers talking about their implementation. Customers like you are gaining value from our solutions, um, talking about what you've done, uh, where the value is, also what the lessons learned are. Uh, besides that, we have, during the conference, 75 breakout sessions. We have 30 demo theaters. We have pods where you can actually meet and uh, talk to our product management team, talk to our solution consultants, uh, and get uh, deeper insight. Uh, we also want to invite you to the Innovation Lab, where since a couple of years we do usability testing and you can give feedback to us. We have developer labs where we really can do hands-on, um, you know, uh, work with our solutions. And uh, finally, we have a closing party. So we have put a wealth of information together for you for the next two days uh, to learn about content services uh, and see what our strategy is all about. Okay, strategy number one. And I usually call this the horses for courses strategy, but um, it could be called the jamming a square peg into a round hole strategy, which is 
we need to take what we originally thought of as ECM and begin to differentiate between the use cases. So the, the basics of ECM around managing large amounts of structured and unstructured information, and in particular the, the, the versioning and all the things and the metadata that we've originally thought of is really differentiating itself into two significant work, work and use cases. The first one I would consider to be the digital workplace. All the tools that are needed to make end users more productive in their day-to-day -day work. It's in particular around ad hoc collaboration, around communication, about, um, about um, the, the actual creation of their PowerPoint files and their Word files, and frankly, What's needed in this area is typically um, people say some silly things sometimes, so the lawyers always want to go looking into this content. So in this content, we need litigation hold and basic life cycle management of the content. The other side of that is what I would consider to be all the things around the, the, the digital business. What you need to take your business processes and make them digital, and really what it comes down to is making your business processes more, more productive as well. And that's typically where we see content services being used to extend into business processes, into business applications. You need some of the high-end document management capabilities that are used in things like engineering and life sciences. You need to be able to capture information coming from outside sources using intelligent capture. You need, of course, you need the records management because this is the stuff that runs your business. And then last but not least, this is the stuff that runs your business for a very long time, so you need archiving as well. And if you, if you kind of look at that, it can really begin to, to be split up a little bit is that we know organizations are adopting 365 very, very quickly, where they're doing that content creation, they're looking after user productivity, and Office 365 does have capabilities for lifecycle management, but we need to connect that set of content into your digital processes as well. So the way that we do that is, is integration into things like um, the desktop, office online, groups, uh, teams, et cetera, bringing that content uses a service-based approach into the repository for your digital business, and then actually being very good citizens and providing back into Office 365 contextualized content based on the business processes now, back into Office 365 where people need to be able to consume that content as well. Yeah, the other aspect is uh, user experience. We think we need to provide an amazing user experience to drive user satisfaction, but also to drive efficiency for the end user, and by doing so, drive adoption of content services. And uh, we've, over the last um, couple of years, uh, re-implemented the user experience on top of Content Suite. Uh, we call that Smart UI. Uh, we've built a framework, actually, and on top of that framework, we step-by-step -step modernized the user experience. So now, today, with that framework, we have the ability to create role-based user experiences, uh, which just provide the information needed for the task at hand to the end user. Uh, the feedback we get from you as our customers is actually very, very good, uh, and you will see us adopting that technology um, across other applications uh, within open text. Same is true for mobile, right? The mobile um, experience is very important, enable the mobile workforce. Uh, we've last year announced a new mobile application for content server. Uh, we've extended it over the last 12 months, and we also uh, integrated extended ECM into that mobile experience. So now you can, for instance, work on uh, tasks which are driven by the extended ECM application where you have information from the leading system connected to the business uh, on the mobile device. And uh, we also have done the same thing for Documentum. So we committed that we're going to conti uh, continue to invest in Documentum. We committed that we're going to deliver a mobile experience for Documentum D2, and that's one of the deliverables of the last couple of months. If you ask me, the taxonomy organizations have deployed has ruined more ECM projects in the world than anything else I know of, right? So how many people have, have dealt with an enormous set of folders that have been created to try and organize permissions, to try to create, organize uh, metadata, to try to organize information. You know, everybody's been through that scenario of, I'm gonna find that document, click, 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 finally get to the folder you think you're going to be in and the folder's empty, right? So what happens with taxonomy is typically it's too deep, it models the business, the organization, rather than business processes. So we think that for success, you need to use a workspace instead of a taxonomy to organize your information, and workspaces are built around business process. So a very small workspace with a couple of folders where the, um, it's 
amazingly evident where the user is supposed to file information, being driven by metadata, allowing you, the user to be able to interact very simply and easily with it rather than having to go through a very deep folder structure that we've typically done in the past. And from our perspective, this idea is so important that we're continuing to invest very, very heavily in this idea of a connected workspace. And we think it's so important that we've put it into, into Content Server uh, right now. It's in Content Server. If you upgrade to 16, it's in there. It's part of the extended ECM suite, and it's what really drives the interaction in extended ECM with business objects and SAP and Salesforce, et cetera. It is a critical, critical change in the way that we are asking people to implement content services and implement content management in general. Using a workspace approach will make your users more effective. Yeah, and the concept of workspace is, is fundamental to build the integrations, we call it the extensions, uh, into leading business applications. So a large part, that's actually the secret source of our success over the last couple of years, um, is, is centered around how do we integrate into leading applications in order to serve those leading applications and the processes which are driven by these applications, whether that's in finance, whether that's in procurement, whether that's in HR, how do we serve those applications and those processes with content services? How do we embed content management natively into the process so that an end user has everything at hand to do the task um, and an end user ideally doesn't even recognize that he or she is really working uh, with a content management system? That started off many, many years back um, in our, uh, with our SAP relationship. So we, you know, done archiving many years back and then we ex invented the extended ECM concept. And over the years, we've expanded that. Uh, we've expanded that in the SAP world with you know, supporting more and more processes, as said, horizontal processes, but also in verticals, like environmental health and safety, just as one example, or in engineering plant maintenance. Um, and in this partnership with SAP, uh, we've you know, always been trailblazing. If we look at technologies, we've always adopted technology first. We've, we've been the first supporting HANA. We've been the first supporting S4 HANA. Uh, we provide today uh, Fiori user interfaces across the board to provide that seamless user experience. And there's a good reason why our good friends and partners from SAP uh, awarded us uh, the 11th consecutive year uh, with the Pinnacle Award. But we've not kind of only focused on SAP, so we've broadened that because your business processes uh, go beyond SAP. They you know, include Salesforce, they include other applications, and uh, we've built integration into other systems. The other part Stephen talked about is about the user productivity. So uh, last year we announced the strategy to embrace Office 365 and we invested a lot in this. So uh, today we provide integration not just in Outlook Online, we provide integration into Teams, we provide integration into groups so that group conversation, for example, can be part uh, of an extended ECM workspace. A group conversation can be part of a business process which is then uh, managed in SAP and you have all the information together in one single place. And that's the real value of what we provide uh, with extended ECM. So working on that theory, basically what we're, what we're realizing is that once you're extending content services into business process, it's wash, rinse, repeat. So a really good example of that is building additional capabilities into extended ECM to allow us to meet a lot of the ad hoc business processes that happen in government. And ad hoc is a bad word. Bespoke is probably a better word. And it's in that that we're, we've created not only the ability to go into additional ac applications, but also we've built in some additional case management functionality, some additional taxonomy capabilities that's really specific to government. Another good example of extending is our Life Sciences, uh, Life Sciences Express application. This is, uh, for me, one of the more exciting things that have happened. It's an application that is made specifically for the people that are working with Documentum Life Sciences Solutions. And it's really about the end user who's tasked with doing things like approving submissions, like interacting with the submissions. Those people don't tend to necessarily be inside the firewall. They tend to be in airports. And very often, they're actually outside of the firewall, outside of the organization, and, and being third parties as well. This application is fully cloud-based, based on our co core platform on OT2 that you saw earlier today, based on that, and is now available for our documented life sciences customers as well. Well, talking about life science, uh, the life science solution suite is uh, primarily built on the Documentum product stack. 
And uh, last year when Documentum joined the open text family, uh, we announced the strategy. And part of that strategy was that we continue to invest in Documentum. We continue to invest in D2 as a client on top of Documentum. And one of the things we heard from you as a customers that uh, we need to renovate the user experience on D2. It's aging. Uh, there needs to be a more modern experience. And I talked about smart UI and the experience we made on Content Suite platform uh, earlier on. So now uh, we actually take the same technology. It's not so much different if you implement a document folder um, or a search um, on you know, a documentum repository versus a, a former open text repository. So we take that technology now uh, and we build a new user experience for Documentum D2. So there will be um, a delightful user experience, configurable, uh, easy to use, role-based, um, on top of Documentum D2. We call the project Unity, and uh, we expect the first release to come with EP5, which is actually fall this year, uh, which is focused on what we call a consumer user, the lightweight use cases. And then there is going to be a next release in uh, spring next year, where we then will have a much more complete user experience on Documentum D2. And I think this is really a big, big step forward and another big commitment to the Documentum customer base. Now, the other thing we got asked for many, many times was, is there a way of providing that uh, integration, connection to the digital business uh, for Documentum as well? And uh, you know, we're, it's like kind of uniting those powerful ideas around user experience now, as well as around the connection to the digital business. And what we're going to provide in that context is that we will uh, work on what we call the extended SAP services for Documentum. So that essentially then will provide you a means of how you can integrate Documentum uh, D2 systems uh, with SAP. OK, so uh, now let's switch gears a little bit. So the other part, or the next part we wanted to talk about is the evolution of content services uh, in the cloud. And um, last year, uh, we announced this strategy around content services, which fundamentally said that we are going to continue to invest in our two major platforms. We are going to continue to invest in Documentum and in Open Text Content Suite. We also said, that we're going to build a platform from ground up, a cloud in a first, in a cloud first approach, where we're going to deliver content services in the cloud, whether it's a document management service, an archiving service, a capture service, a media management service, a content conversion service. We will deliver those services, and we also said that on top of those services, we will build applications, applications like Core for file sync and share, like an application like Snap for capture. We also said that part of this strategy is this hybrid approach where we want to build applications, uh, which could, for example, be industry applications like Life Sciences Express, where we extend an existing solution like Documentum Life Sciences with an application um, in the cloud. And uh, we have parts of the workload running in the cloud, parts of uh, the solution are running on premise. And we also said that we're going to extend in the cloud also to these endpoints which are moving to the cloud. Like we're going to build an integration from there to success factors. We're going to build an integration into Salesforce. This is what we're famous for. This is what we can do really, really well. We've seen uh, just recently a demo. Um, and we not just know the technology best, we also have those relationships. And that makes it uh, very, very powerful. And that was the strategy we announced last year. And now we've worked for another year. And uh, we've come quite far during that year. And uh, who better uh, than uh, Savigny Berry, who is uh, actually our VP of cloud services, who better than Savigny uh, give us insight in what we've done over the last 12 months and where we are. Savigny. Thank you, Michael. Um, hello, game, everybody. Um, hope you had a nice lunch. And, um, and, and uh, starting to see some of the uh, really amazing um, additions to the roadmap, the innovations that the team has been putting together. So what I wanted to cover in the next few minutes here is perhaps a click in more detail uh, in what you heard in the keynote. So you heard about OT2 in the keynote from Mark. Um, I'll go into a little more detail on that. 
and, um, and give you a flavor of what you're going to see as you go into the different booths, the different breakout sessions, where each of those things fit in. But just echoing what Michael just said, that previous slide, this thing, this was our blueprint. This was literally how we were looking at content services um, and saying, all right, how do we take each one of these layers and address that and create all the simplicity for you while hiding the complexity behind the scenes? And that's exactly what we did. In fact, it was always supposed to be simple. When you started your journey on content management, whether that was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or it was two years ago, it was supposed to be simple. You were supposed to be able to just get a platform and be able to do any records management on it, any retention management on it, collaborate with the content on it, create the right roles and permissions, and then be able to integrate that with existing systems that you might have, ERP, uh, CRM, and others. So it was supposed to be simple. But somewhere along the way, more, more things got added, more features got added, more functions got added. So now we're at the point where we're taking a step back and saying, how do we give you all of those feature sets? How do we give you all the things that you've come to rely, us on, uh, rely to us on, but make it simple? If you are in IT, um, you're always thinking about how do I simplify and standardize my, my software that I'm using. If you are in the line of business, if you're a business user, um, you're asking about how can I do my job better, whether that's am I a financial analyst, I am a, um, uh, I, I, I am a HR manager, I'm a procurement person, how can I do my job better? And you're most likely talking to your IT counterpart to, to ask that question, or going to the internet, typing up some of those Google words, and then subscribing with your credit card with a service that was already there. And then if you're a developer, how can you create more applications based on the content services that are provided by OpenText? You saw a sneak peek of that earlier this morning about where we are going by empowering you to create those applications by giving you all of those services in this OT2 modern developer platform. So that's where we started. <clears throat> we started our journey with Project Banff. Uh, you heard Mark talk about that. That was about a year or so ago. And now Project Banff has morphed into release OT2. That's sort of our next generation hybrid cloud platform. And I emphasize the word hybrid. That's probably something you'll hear over and over again as you go to different sessions. We're not talking about cloud only. We're not talking about on-premise only. We're talking about hybrid. Why is that important? Because you, we know you've already made the investment in deploying your software on-premise in some cases. In some cases, you've taken that software, you've put that into a managed services cloud, and you're trying to extend that investment. In some cases, you're looking at cloud-only, perhaps, solutions as well. But we know that we don't want you to move everything to the cloud. That's just not how it's going to work. So how do you make it all work together? How do you make it work together in a hybrid approach? That's our goal. That's our design principle. Every single product that you'll see as part of OT2 will have that design principle. So what are the key things in that? Number one, made for IT. A set of microservices. Mark talked about that earlier this morning. That's a, that's a list of microservices that's going to continue to grow, whether that's around um, viewing, um, document management, uh, archiving, et cetera. The SaaS applications, that's the uh, turnkey, off-the-shelf applications that you can get if you want to start using them. And they are deeply integrated. They are deeply integrated. And then third, obviously, is the developer platform. So taking one level below now, so this becomes, starts to become a little more detailed, so bear with me. Uh, this is a chart which talks about what are the components of OT2. On the left side, you'll see a screen which says all of our existing single tenant applications, whether that's Documentum, Content Server, the industry solutions, life sciences, uh, capital projects, uh, energy and engineering, all of these, extended ECM, all of these solutions, they are all in the category on the left side. What we are doing there is we are containerizing all of these solutions. And containerizing, again, is it's not a panacea for everything. It doesn't make magic happen. But what it does do is it allows you to be able to get that software much faster, deployed either on-premise or in the cloud, and be able to upgrade much faster. That is one thing we hear all the time, is how do I reduce my TCO? Which means, how do I reduce my time to upgrade? How do I reduce my time for deployment? That's what that left side of the section does is containerize those solutions so we can do that for you. 
The right side is the SaaS applications. And again, I mentioned hybrid SaaS applications. And you'll see two types of applications in this category. One would be broad, horizontal applications, um, which can apply to pretty much every, any industry you choose. So things like external sharing or contract management, regardless of whether you are in transportation, in manufacturing, in uh, life sciences, in healthcare, in financial services, you need to share files. You need to be able to manage your contracts. How do you do that? Well, we've created those applications that are being used by our customers today, and you'll hear from some of them, uh, which are then deeply connected back to the, so the content sources. The content sources are still your uh, system of record, whether that's content server or documentum or email. Email is a huge content source. Or, or any file shares or home directories. These are all the major content sources. These are the systems of records. You are not changing them. We recognize that. So we're taking that, but we're extending that through to these applications who are now providing you very purpose-built use cases. So I talked about two broad horizontal applications. Let's talk about some specific vertical applications. One is um, an HR application, People Center, which is focused on HR ticket management. Um, how do you take somebody from hire to retire, that entire life cycle? Um, how do you take somebody from a place where they, you can manage the tickets inside if somebody's uh, logging in an issue for, hey, I cannot access my HR portal or I've, I've submitted my review a little late, is that okay? How do you, take, how do you, how do you uh, create the li uh, life cycle around that? How do you manage that? That's, that's People Center. Legal, that's another uh, vertical. So there's an application that we'll be developing there. Uh, the digital asset management, um, there's an application that'll be there. So there's some vertical applications there. Having said that, there will be a lot of gaps. There will be a lot of opportunities. We can't solve all those problems ourselves. All the various application needs are in, in all the industry types, we're not going to be able to solve that ourselves. That's why we created the third component of OT2, which is the developer platform. So we're hoping that what this does is it unlocks the potential for you as customers where you already have developers in your own organization or as partners who want to partner with us to be able to create your own IP and then build those applications and then sell it to your customers. But now you can do that. So these are the three components of OT2. Underlying that, you notice the glue which sits underneath that is our PaaS layer, our platform as a service layer. And that's Cloud Foundry. We selected Cloud Foundry. There were a lot of other options out there, but we selected Cloud Foundry. And then under that is our infrastructure. Our infrastructure as a service, which is based on OpenText Cloud. But as you heard Mark announce earlier this morning, we are also going to open up our managed service solutions for the AWS, Azure, and Google platform. So that's OT2. You saw this earlier. I'm going to reiterate this again. What this means is that release 16 still continues. Along with that, OT2 continues as well, which means you get the best of both worlds. The release 16, you still keep getting the value for the enhancement packs while you, still keep, while you start to get more value for the OT2 sets of releases, more releases on the applications, on the services, and on the platform. Now, to actually talk about what this uh, application does to, uh, to you and the value it provides to you, what better way to do that but to actually hear it from one of our customers. So I'd like to invite on stage Riley McIntosh from Pacific Life. Riley, welcome. Thanks, Avanier. So again, my name is Riley McIntosh. I'm from Pacific Life Insurance Company. We're in Newport Beach, California. That's back where my comfort zone is. Um, and um, I'm not here today to tell you that I have all of the answers to how to do enterprise content management. I don't think anyone does, um, especially with all of the changes that come at us with regulations and changes in technology and, and new business ventures. But I am here to share with you some of the things that um, have made us successful at Pacific Life with really establishing a very strong foundation in um, enterprise content management. So I like to describe content management as a journey. Um, it's not a destination. It's not a project. It truly is a program. Um, and I've been doing this for a little over 11 years, and I'm just finally now seeing some real success um, at our company. Um, there's been a lot of starts and stops along the way, um, and I'd say that if I could just be really authentic, um, I think so often we are trying to get everything perfect, 
right? We're trying to figure out every last detail before we move forward. And by the time we get to that stage, things have already changed. Um, and so one lesson that we learned is that don't strive for perfection in everything. Um, and also another key was to not just focus on risk. That's what we had been doing for many, many years. That was really at the heart of the program, and it was just risk, risk, which is obviously very important. But you can't forget um, the business value. You can't stop the business, right? They have to earn money for the company. Um, and so I think that the moment that um, our enterprise content management program really took off was when we finally figured out that we have to combine the risk with the business value. Um, and so by some turn of events last year uh, and a reorganization, um, I used to just run the risk side of the house. Um, and now I run both the technology and the risk. So bringing those two together um, has really made us successful. I have here what our vision statement is, um, and it seems really easy. Um, I don't think any senior leader would say, hey, don't do this. Don't do effective and efficient content management. Um, so they're all happy to say, yes, please go do this. But it's not that easy to do. And I'm sure you're all well aware of that. Um, again, going back to aligning the governance and the technology, for us, that meant not, I think earlier today, someone said, you, you start where you are. And I think sometimes you have to go back a bit and really start with the foundations for an ECM program. Um, for Pacific Life, we have acquired so much technology over the years. Um, we had spread ourselves so thin in our ability to um, resource these very complex content management systems. Um, and so we are really not getting the value out of them, uh, and we are also not mitigating risk. So we took a step back and really looked at what do we own today? Um, and what are we trying to strive for? Um, our technology portfolio is something that we spent some time, um, actually took a lot of time, a lot of buy-in. And we're a very decentralized organization with um, different business lines running very autonomously. So to have an enterprise vision for how we manage content and consume content took a lot of buy-in. Um, I think one of the values of establishing this technology portfolio is it kind of stopped the bleeding, right? The businesses see a cool new technology and they say, go buy it, let's get this. And we go buy it and then we try to implement it. And really we're not getting the value out of it because we didn't stop and think about the integration or what is the purpose and how many people is, is this tool actually going to reach. So really um, spending the time to establish some consistent standards around what, our, what is in your technology portfolio. You know, we may own um, way more technology than we want today, but we sort of draw a line in the sand and said, no more. Here's what our platforms are. Here's the value they provide. They might provide additional capability that we don't support today, but it probably makes more sense to develop that expertise and that knowledge in that platform rather than go buying another one and, and adding and spreading our resources really thin. Um, the goal of the program really these simple things that you see here. Um, higher quality decision making. Uh, I can't tell you how many times the business has questioned their decisions because they don't know if they have the right version and, and everyone's keeping their secret copy. Um, and so we've really focused on using uh, open text content server for our crown jewels, our unstructured data um, to support better decision making. Again, more effective and efficient use of IT resources, um, both in the platforms and the people. We want to get really good at what's in our technology platform, our portfolio, and sell that to the business so they don't feel like they're going out and finding the technology. That's our job. Oops, sorry. Um, and along with that, you get the enhanced risk management, right? Because these platforms, you're establishing the governance and the standards. Um, the businesses don't have to really worry about the risk. They just know what platform I use for what. Um, and we built the, the risk mitigation behind that. Um, automated, automation and ing integration is something that is key to uh, what we do. And when we do acquire a new platform, we really think about how does this integrate? Or is this going to, although it's very cool, um, is it going to introduce new manual processes to the organization, which is counterintuitive to what we're trying to do. So again, it's been a long journey. Um, and I would say that 
really going back to foundations and establishing those standards is, is key. Um, the risk side of things um, has always been a driver. You know, we have our CCO um, and legal counsel always driving that home, but for Pacific Life, we've never had that one moment where we really got burned. Um, knock on wood, hopefully. Um, but it, it's usually not a matter of if, it's when. And so we're really trying to position ourselves to, to embed that risk mitigation into day-to-day -day processes. Um, another key, I think, to our success is in change management um, and really taking the time with our end users to level set expectations. Um, I think change management, it, it's talked about all the time, um, but I, I think about it more as a, as a mindset um, that we try to, at least in IT in our organization, really build as this more innovative mindset and addressing some of those things that prohibit you or prevent you from moving forward. Um, you know, things like failing quickly and changing the course. Um, it's okay to fail sometimes. Um, can't really be innovative without doing that. Being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, a lot of changes with technology means the end user has to do things differently. Um, talking to the business about um, changing their process, right? A lot of times they want to use our technology, um, but they don't want to change the process. So I'm just automating your already crappy process. You're, you're not really going to see the benefits. And so at the heart of all of these things that we're trying to do is really open text, uh, content server, well, products, as well as some of the services. So a strategic move for us last year was to go to cloud managed services. And that has been, um, so key to us moving the program forward. I have a very small team and we run a lot of, of the large complex platforms and so I can redeploy those resources from operations to building solutions for the business, really giving the business the value um, and leveraging open text for all that it can offer. Um, we're utilizing core, right, because of integration with content server. We were on Box and we had KiteWorks um, and we've scaled all that back and said, you know, we're going to go with core. We see the long-term vision. Um, and that's something that's been great. Um, the partnership that we have with Open Text, I think um, I'm super happy about. My team would agree. Um, the transition to the cloud managed services wasn't easy, um, won't lie to you. But they really, truly were a partner. And we, we stopped many points along the way as a gate check to make sure we were headed in the right direction. Um, and at the heart of what we are trying to do is make sure that this foundation gives us the ability to remain agile, to adopt new technologies, where we don't have something in our platform, we can react quickly, um, but still maintaining that ability to mitigate risk without stopping the business from what they're doing. So um, that's all I have. Thank you for your time. And Savigny. OK, thank you, Riley. So hopefully what you saw a picture of over there was a, a view of where OT2 is going, what we are doing for you in the cloud um, very deliberately, and solving problems for you on premise as well as for applications. You heard it from our customers. You saw demos. So, now, just go ahead and please go out to the booths. Please go out to the other sections, and st you'll start to get more details into that. Thanks so much. We'll go into the next section now. Digital has changed business forever. And with IoT and AI, the next wave of change is on us. Connected devices are redefining how we work especially in asset-intensive industries where drones are replacing physical inspections, capturing video and sensor data, running real-time analytics, reducing inspection timelines from weeks to days, and reducing safety risks. The information captured by drones is a highly valuable resource to drive productivity and innovation. But the challenge lies in how you capture and use it effectively. How do you make it accessible and useful for the people who need it and secure it from those who don't? This is what OpenText and partners like SAP do best.
Let's look at how drone footage can be used to transform an asset inspection workflow. First, the plant operator creates the correct work order type in SAP plant maintenance. The work order identifies the video requirement and automatically synchronizes the metadata to the workspace in SAP Hybris Digital Asset Management by OpenText. This creates a task, triggering the maintenance technician to launch a drone and capture footage. The footage is uploaded and attached to the work order. SAP and OpenText process the video and extract the metadata, synchronizing it across both systems. Date, time, location, device, resolution, and more. The quality engineer responsible for assessing the need for repairs reviews the video using OpenText Extended ECM for SAP solutions and the Digital Asset Management solution. A quick search of maintenance orders in the system directs him to the right work order. Here he has access to all the data associated with that work order, work instructions, correspondence, and more. He accesses the drone video from the Media tab, which contains all related metadata. He reviews the footage, looking for corrosion or other abnormalities. The More Details tab allows him to quickly add or change information, such as metadata, security policies, relationships. Then he creates a subclip containing just the video relevant to his decision. He does this directly in Digital Asset Management. No need for external editing software. The new asset is automatically attached to the work order and the appropriate metadata is added to the file. This is how OpenText and SAP help tap the power of drone technology, bringing together video, content, and data with business process, automating the end-to-end -end workflow, putting content in context, maximizing the value of information to create new insights, drive productivity and innovation, Open Text connects content to your digital business. Woo! Wow. So, you know, Mark, Mark talked a little bit this morning about, you know, jobs that didn't exist a few years ago. I think doing the uh, content management of drone video was probably not in anybody's resume a few years ago, right? The, the, the definition of what we're doing in terms of information management, the types of content that we're managing is changing and changing very, very quickly. And it gives us a really good segue into the next part of the agenda, which is the expanding definition of information management. And it is a, is a really good way of bringing up my next guest, which is uh, John Mancini. Chief Evangelist Officer for AIM, a good friend of mine, and I think from, from my perspective, nobody better to talk about where we're headed in terms of information management uh, in this industry today. So John, please, please enjoy yourself up here. Thank you, Steve. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Thank you all so much, OpenText, for the invitation to be here. Um, OpenText is a good friend uh, of the industry, and uh, we really do appreciate the leadership role that they play within the content management space. And so as I listened to Mark this morning and listened to Malcolm, listened to all the speakers, the, a common element in what everybody was talking about is this notion of change. And so, um, like any good keynote speaker, I thought I would tee this up with three inspirational quotes about change that are probably suitable for framing. So first one here, from Charles Kettering, a leading industrialist. Um, people are very open-minded about new things, as long as they're exactly like the old ones. And I've experienced that in this space, where people, despite all the changes that are going on in this space, like to hold on to what was. Um, and there's a, there's a certain re resonance and reason for that because when you have had past successes, it's hard sometimes to let go of some of those successes and take them to the next level. So that got me thinking about another quote. And this one is from John Kenneth Galbraith, which is that face between the choice of changing one's mind and proving that there is no need to do so, everybody gets busy on the proof. And so I think about this back in uh, January of last year when Gartner had that kind of sort of unsettling you know, pronouncement that ECM was dead. And almost everybody got to work basically trying to figure out how do they disprove that? Rather than think to themselves, well, what's the element of truth that's embodied in that? And what can we learn from that? So my third intellectual, this is perhaps the smartest guy of all, point sometimes to the fact that we underestimate how difficult change is. And this is George Carlin, which 
I put a dollar in the change machine and nothing happened. And so my point there is that we tend to underestimate the effort that's associated with change. We tend to underestimate how difficult it is to actually change organizations and technology infrastructures that exist at large scale. So we are in a very disruptive time. We're actually, strangely enough, in two disruptive times because we have the wave of disruption that occurred as a result of the web and the result of mobile technologies and kind of the onset of cloud technologies. And now we've got the onset of AI and machine learning technologies. So the generations are collapsing. We're on the tail end of one generation, the beginning of another generation. And so they really manifest themselves when the cumulative inertia of technology innovation, disruption doesn't happen at the point of technology innovation. Disruption happens when that disruption is standardized and translates itself into business models. And that's where we are now. And that's why content feels and content management feels so different than the old world that we used to know. And so when you think about this, um, this survey was done by uh, Stowe Boyd, and Stowe went out and talked to um, a whole set of enterprise strategists in organizations. And he posed 22 innovative technologies and asked them to evaluate the importance to their organization. And these six were at the top of the list. Cybersecurity, AI and machine learning, cloud computing, data analytics, big data, and the Internet of Things. And I think in many ways, they're a microcosm of what we talked about this morning. And they raised the question of where does content fit into this? And more particularly, I think, how does it tie to the future? And for me, I think the future is all about how what I would call how content connects with the three A's. And it's all about apps, it's all about automation, and it's all about artificial intelligence. And so we set out earlier this year to talk to people in the content and business process management space, um, senior executives in that space, to try to find out where they were on this question of digital transformation, how they saw content te technologies evolving, and how they saw this universe changing moving forward. And Open Text was actually also a sponsor of this research, and we'll be sending out a copy of all this to all the attendees. But I wanted to cover four key points tied to this to maybe put a bit of a frame around some of the conversations that we've had so far today and that we'll have over the next couple of days. So the first one is that in disruptive times, every organization is on or should be on a digital transformation journey. And the punctuation point I want to put on this is that those journeys aren't just tactical. They are strategic, and they relate to the fundamental task of understanding, anticipating, and redefining internal and external customer experiences. And so the first question we asked folks, this is about 350 executives, is we said, are you concerned, agree or disagree, that you could face serious disruption of your business model in the next two years? So over 50% of organizations basically see themselves as reflected in these very disruptive times that we were talking about. So we asked them, okay, well, what are you doing about that? And there's some good news there. People have translated that intention into embracing the need for digital transformation within their organizations. So over 80% basically agree with the statement that digital transformation is important or very important to their organization. So the follow-up question, which then gets kind of to the whole point of this conference, the whole point as we think about the future of content management, is how are you doing on those transformation journeys? And what you have here, we asked people where they wanted to be by 2020. It's only 18 months from now. Where do you want to be, and how complete are your plans moving down that path towards 2020? And only one in five are really where they want to be. So, that raised the second point of the survey, which was to think about, OK, well, why is that? And my hypothesis is that the reason for that is they are imperiled by a rising tide of information chaos and confusion. And it's frustrating their, their desire to transform their organizations. And in many ways, the data points that I'll show reflect this slide. 
You know, we have deployed more and more and more content technologies, often to very good result, but we've done it in the face of a rising tide of information that has to be managed, and many organizations are just running faster and faster and faster in order to stay in the same place. And so when you look at the data, we ask this question, how many different content management systems do you use? Riley referred to this in terms of their desire to standardize. And I asked, actually, incidentally, asked this same question five years ago to folks. And the number of, average number of content systems in use has increased by 30% over the last five years. So this question of content sprawl is an issue that people are facing in their transformation efforts. We ask this question, you know, hopefully these systems have gotten a whole lot more easy to integrate into line of business applications. You know, the reality, when we ask people what percentage of your unstructured content resides in those line of business systems as opposed to resides within your content management system, things haven't changed a whole lot, which is a source of frustration as people seek to transform. We then ask people to do a bit of a self-assessment. And this one, I dug up a question from 10 years ago and asked it again to ask them to evaluate the overall effectiveness of their organization in managing, controlling, and utilizing electronic information. And as you can see by the number at the bottom, the average hasn't really changed. So there's a lot of frustration out there in terms of how people manage. And it's not because they haven't done great things with regards to point ECM solutions. The challenge is that the stakes are rising and the degree of challenge is rising faster than our ability to assimilate it. So what this is doing, and this is where I think the Gartner quote comes into play, is it's creating a demand for a different way of looking at content and information management, a different kind of set of practices. And it was totally reflected in Mark's conversations earlier about where open text is headed. So the first data point, we ask people, in general, you know, what are your intentions with regards to delivery deployment models over the next 12 months? And you can see here that bar 48% moving towards a hybrid cloud and on-premise um, deployment model. 36% moving towards the cloud. Over 80% in some dimension having the cloud as an important part of their information management strategy moving forward. Again, consider this is among content and business process executives within organizations. I can tell you, three years ago, you had the exact opposite. You would have had everybody saying, I don't really want to go in this direction. So a tipping point, to tip the hat to Malcolm Gladwell here. Second one, a real change in how the, they want to consume these capabilities. And so for 70% of organizations, this monolithic model that was kind of characteristic of the old way that we looked at ECM, it's really been replaced by a desire to consume on demand, to consume content services on demand, and consume them in the context of business processes. That's a big change in terms of how people view content management. This third point, um, what does this mean in terms of your existing strategy? Do you think you have to modernize? And over 90% basically say something has to change. And so that's a really interesting time. I think it reflects an intention on the part of the community to adjust to those disruptive pressures that are out there. And as you think about this and think about the impact that this has on ECM and on traditional content management, you know, consumerization has created a need for simplicity. The cloud has created a demand that you don't just bolt on a cloud strategy. It has to be created from the start. Privacy creates a need for automated governance. Rising tides of data create a need for an intelligent way of capturing all of that. This idea of business platforms that you want to plug together like Lego blocks creates this idea for a demand for open content services. And this rise of machine learning creates a need to finally get your content and information management house in order, or you're not going to have anything to plug into all that wonderful machine learning technology when it comes on stream. So what this means, I think, and as I think about this from an AIM perspective, we think that there are four what we call intelligent information management practices or methodologies out here. 
that organizations are looking to embrace as part of their transformation portfolio. They're critical to digital transformation. Notice that I don't say that this is a market segment. This is a set of disciplines and technologies, and very much, I think, parallels where open text has gone with the enterprise information management approach that they've had in the last couple of years. This is not one segment. These are multiple segments that need to interconnect together. So as you think about this, this is how we've defined it. We've gone and we've categorized these according to these four big practice areas. These are the technology elements associated with each of those practice areas. And as I think about the activities of AIM moving forward, our challenge is going to be to help people figure out which of these tools are germane to the particular business challenge that they have and how they, can they consume these, these technology capabilities in a modular way and in a way that plugs into each other. So two last data points on this kind of world that we call intelligent information management. Um, we asked that crowd of ECM and BPM senior executives, where, what five of these do you spend your most blood, sweat, and tears and money on right now? And these are the five that popped up. Business process management, records management, cloud content management, collaboration platforms, and document classification and PII. And so that's really the foundation, I think, that this industry has had for a long time. And I asked him a second question, because I wanted to get a feel for how forward-leaning these folks are. As I said, when you look over the next 18 to 24 months, where are you planning on spending more? And so the answer, I think, is, is revelatory in terms of where all this is going. The first answer they gave me was all these five. So they are doubling down on their investments, which I think is a good thing for the content management space moving forward. The second thing is they popped up these additional four, content integration and migration, AI content, content analytics and semantics, data recognition, and metadata and taxonomy management, which says to me that there is a forward-looking lean into the world of artificial intelligence, into the world of machine learning, a future positioning of what they're trying to do moving forward. So I have one last thought about disruption, and going back to my point about change is I think organizations, and particularly organizations in this room, organizations in this community, organizations in this industry, have a unique advantage in an era of analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning in that we all collectively are sitting on all that information that is potentially the fuel for those initiatives. And I think all of us have a choice of where we are going to be with regards to that wave that is coming. And that wave is coming. And do we want to be underneath that wave, or do we want to ride that wave? And if we want to ride that wave, then I think we have to embrace change. Thank you all very much. John, thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, I couldn't have finished with a better graphic. Fit right into the, uh, fit right into the, the theme. Um, you've already kind of brought it up, but I wanted to get your take on where we're headed, and Mark was talking a lot about the intelligent and connected enterprise and intelligent and connected information management. Does that sort of fit in with where AIM is looking at information management as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, those of you that aren't familiar with AIM, we got our life started, believe it or not, 75 years ago as the National Micrographics and Microfilm Association. We've always been about people, process, and technology. Um, we evolved into AIM, the Association for Information and Image Management, about 20 years ago. And then just this past year, changed the name to the Association for Intelligent Information Management. So I think the alignment is very clear and it, it, it definitely is in line with what you guys are talking about. Awesome. Good, thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thank you. So that's actually a perfect segue from uh, intelligent information management over to the intelligent and connected enterprise and how we bring those things together. So I, I brought this up a little bit earlier, but I, I think, as I said, thinking about people's roles, people's jobs, the things that they're responsible for, when you begin to take a look at this now, and uh, not to be overwhelmed by the graphic, but to think a little bit, what does this mean for me and the things that people are asking me to do? 
right? It used to be people would ask me to do the document management and a lot of people that were doing document management were obviously very related and associated to doing a lot of, of business process management as well, right? That hasn't gone away. But I think the, the request when we start to think about information management is expanding all the time, right? I think everybody is realizing the impact that artificial intelligence analytics is having on the industry in general, in our ability to automate things, in our ability to understand and gain insight, and, and in particular, if we think about all the things that we have typically looked at as adoption problems in the past, there's a lot of area where we can use a combination of automation and what I think of as applications, and I know John talked about that as well, is let's start thinking about um, content management as an idea of putting together applications that fit specific business purposes, not just a jack, uh, a jack of all trades application that we are asking users to try and interpret. Let's go to the point where applications are easy enough for people who understand the business process to be able to pick that up and move ahead. And really that's what we're, we're thinking about when it's in, uh, enabling the intelligent and connected enterprise. But I also think that in doing that, as we think about expanding it, there are some challenges coming our way as well. Um, first one, we've already actually already seen it in the demonstration, right? Or in the movie, excuse me, is that, that the, the type of content that we're being asked to manage is changing constantly and changing rapidly. So managing video being a really good example, right? So how do, we, how do we go about managing video in a way that makes sense and do all the same things that we've always liked about um, content management? Understanding and using metadata, being able to contextualize it in the business process. So one of the things that we've tried to do is do another integration and integrate in our media management application into extended ECM so that we can again continue to manage information in context. Another area where we're seeing a huge amount of adoption recently is again in automation because documents, although documents are the things that people will continue to consume, authoring documents is becoming quite different and in, in particular automating the authoring, authoring of documents makes a lot of sense in high volume circumstances. So HR being a really good example, we're seeing a lot of demand for things like document generation capability being driven from the metadata and the structured information coming from the um, leading application to create documents, file documents, get users out of the way of doing the things that we know they're not particularly good at. And I think we're gonna continue to see this idea as type, content types change, documents will still be important, but we have to go and move towards handling them in a different way. The other piece changing is the connections we have to deal with, right? So the, we believe that connected content is valuable content. Uh, content needs to be embedded in business processes, uh, in business applications. And um, in the past, it uh, was actually much easier than today. So in the past, in an on-premise world, on the left-hand side, uh, we integrated with your on-premise SAP system, for example. We integrated with your on-premise Oracle system. We all knew and learned how to integrate with Office, uh, which was also a kind of an on-premise system. Now, the world is changing, right? We have applications which are sitting in the cloud. Your HR department makes the decision to go with success factors. Um, your service department is making the decision to go with service now, and out of the sudden, uh, you have to have, you know, integrate with other endpoints uh, than before, and that is much harder to do in the cloud. Uh, we provide standard integration to those. Uh, we also provide standard integration uh, to the productivity suites moving to the cloud, like Office 365, we talked about this. Um, and uh, the other integration point we see coming up more and more is cloud platforms. Uh, what are cloud platforms? SAP, for example, has their own cloud platform, which is called SAP Cloud Platform. Force.com is a cloud platform. And uh, those cloud platforms actually enable us um, to integrate through standard means. In the SAP case, for example, that means if you look at that picture, uh, you have various SAP applications sitting in the cloud, like Ariba, like Conquer, like SuccessFactors. We have a shift uh, to S4 HANA Cloud. And the integration point for SAP is the SAP Cloud Platform. Uh, so we build an integration of our content services through what they call SAP Content Bridge uh, into SAP Cloud Platform, and that actually enables us through one integration point to serve many SAP applications. And um, as we, you know, I, I, I don't think I promised too much, as we are the number one SAP partner, 
innovating with them for many, many years. We are certainly working together how we can, in the future, more and more deliver these content services as part, as, uh, as part of the SAP Cloud Platform. So you will see that through the standard integrations, you out of a sudden support more than one application. You support you know, various applications with content services. Uh, and we're still working on uh, also providing a deep UI integration so that the user experience, once again, uh, is where you expect it to be. Same is true for Salesforce, right? Um, if you look at Salesforce, they're using force.com as a platform. On force.com, you have various applications, whether it's sales, whether it's service modules, marketing, uh, the community module. And as we have a standard integration point, um, into the force.com platform, we can actually serve various of the Salesforce applications and we can once again uh, manage content consistently in one place uh, across different applications and through that standard integration, we also um, have to comply to the kind of so-called cloud qualities needed uh, in the Salesforce world as well. So that's another integration point uh, where through those cloud platforms, we can just simply uh, serve more of these applications in the future. Once again, UI integration is key, uh, which is something we certainly provide as well. And last but not least, uh, we've seen Savigny, or we've heard Savigny talk about OT2, and uh, we will deliver those content services in the cloud, document management, format conversion, document generation, viewing, um, and as those services are available in the cloud, we want our customers, our partners, to build applications such as we do. And uh, with a developer environment, uh, which we have uh, on top of that, uh, you can actually build in the cloud your own content services-driven, purpose-built applications. So I, I, I can't think of a, a, a better area to think about as both being a challenge and an opportunity as, as automation in that AI, machine learning, et cetera. And so let's think about what automation can do for us, right? The, 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 the basic premise for me is you can't manage what you don't understand, right? And so if we are going to understand stuff and be able to manage information, we need metadata. Metadata drives records management classification, records man or metadata drives uh, search capabilities, metadata drives the ability to bring content, content into context of other business processes and can even do things like routing and security, et cetera, as well. So that's great, except people are just terrible at applying metadata. We all have seen instances where end users are just not willing to apply metadata on content because it's not, it's not really important to them. It's the people that are consuming the information most of the time that really need the metadata. So let's get the people out of the way. I think there's huge opportunity for us in automating the capture and application of metadata as the step towards information governance. And in particular now, more and more steps into business process. And I, in my opinion, there has probably been no bigger request in all the time that I interact with customers than what I've always thought of as the magic bucket. We've got the magic funnel here. The magic bu bucket is a place where content comes in it's understood well enough to be able to make a decision about that content, to extract the, the information. And I thought the customer that spoke this morning about going from facts, which is a blob of information, to a document, to eventually data, is exactly that. And then, in fact, kicking off a business process. And that's really what we're looking for in intelligent capture and automation. That ability to not only get, get end users out of the way of applying metadata, but actually kicking off business process that is effective and, again, automated. And what do you need with that? Well, I mean, capture for sure is not new, right? Um, what is changing is that capture gets more and more distributed. So we want to capture information right in the very moment uh, information gets created, like a salesperson ca just capturing a contract. Um, and then you want to capture the information on the fly. Uh, you want to classify a document. You want to store it automatically. Um, and uh, you also want to embed that into the business process so it's not standalone. It should actually be embedded uh, into, for example, a Salesforce application which is running on the mobile device. It should uh, be embedded into an SAP application running on the mobile device, or it should be embedded into an open text application uh, which is uh, created with AppWorks, but it's embedded. It's not uh, standalone. And um, also, as we you know, move along with this notion, as building more applications, we want to provide them in the cloud, uh, we cannot expect customers on Capture to create templates with professional services, 
uh, weeks and weeks, uh, you know, optimization to um, get the data uh, from the content you expect. So what we've de um, developed is machine learning technology. Uh, we've actually made uh, great progress on that one. For example, we're great in invoice capture. We're the largest vendor uh, delivering invoice capture solutions. And uh, with machine learning technology, we now have uh, even replaced what we've done before around invoice capture. And that technology really allows us on the fly, very easy to learn at the end user level without creating a lot of template work around that. Um, and this paired with key user configuration embedded in an application, we can really talk about intelligent capture. So we deliver applications which right from the go learn. And after a couple of capture processes, uh, we can actually extract information, store information, and kick off uh, the business process. Next challenge is something we should all actually be familiar with. And I, I guess the, the thing about compliance is that it just keeps coming back and keeps coming back and keeps coming back. So information governance, compliance, um, there'll be a new regulation, new capability. Everything is digital these days. Every investigation is digital. Um, what we need to do with that um, hasn't really changed. It's just the, the scope and the complexity of some of the things that we need to do. So just one delicious example that an awful lot of organizations are dealing with right now, which is uh, you know, a component, just a, a small part of GDPR, right? The, what we've talked about, the right to be forgotten. And so you know, at a most basic level, in order to be able to um, allow organizations to be able to respond to um, uh, real people, who ask for their information, whether you're a bank, a utility company, um, um, a telephone company, anybody who is keeping um, invoices and keeping uh, transactions about a particular customer can now be asked in the UK to be able to give that information over or ensure that it's been deleted. So you need to know what you have, right? You can't not be able to find that information for them. You need to have retention and disposition policies that make sense against that. You need to be able to do the same things we've always done from an e-discovery perspective, be able to know if that content has to be on litigation hold before you actually delete it. And I think you need all the things that we've always thought about when it comes to archiving to be able to keep the information and make that information findable. And more and more, because of GDPR is a good example for people who are thinking about information management, it has to be across structured and unstructured information. I think the good news is, for, for almost everybody who's in the audience right now, you're probably in some form or another a customer who has an awful lot of those tools at their fingertips already. Right, so all the way from, from the ability to search for information, the ability to organize it properly in the first place, litigation holds, records management policies, retention disposition workflows, they're all more or less available in the tools you probably have today. So that they're at your fingertips, and in particular, if you're using us for things like um, um, extended ECM for SAP, we're bridging that gap between the structured and unstructured information as well. And speaking of which, bridging that gap between structured and unstructured information, I think uh, we talked about it for the first time from an open text perspective last year, but InfoArchive is a really, really strong application for responding to your GDPR requirements, particularly when it comes to that bridge between structured and unstructured information. So starting with legacy applications where um, where suddenly now, thanks to, a lot, to, thanks to GDPR, there's a requirement to be able to access that information. So decommissioning some of those applications and providing good access to that information is very good. Active archiving to bring some of the cost out of your actual leading active applications makes sense. We're also seeing, if you go back to that comment about um, banks, utility companies, et cetera, having to produce information due to the right to be forgotten. The importance of being able to get in and work with print streams and all the invoices that you printed, all the statements that you printed, be able to go in and very selectively be able to disposition the content when, a, when an end user or a, a real customer asks for that information. So InfoArchive is about capturing that information, making it accessible, making it accessible in ways not only from a compliance perspective, but that same capability we were talking about can also be used as an example to provide a hub for customers to come in to get their statement on demand. So we're even seeing organizations monetize this capability as a, an add-on extra for, for their website where they're, they're accessing information on demand for their customers, get my invoice, get my statement on demand. So I'm gonna finish up with a couple of just calls to action. Things to think about, things to think about when you're going back to the office, looking at your existing content services projects, a lot of the things that Riley provided just segue really nicely into this. So first of all, I'd like to ask people to, to 
think back a little bit around our strategies for success, right? The, these are things that work with customers day in, day out. Um, it's basically based on this idea of content services and extending them into lead applications, right? Which is make sure you're using the, the right capabilities and separate the difference between the digital workplace and the digital business. Um, have an amazing UI where, where in, users interact with it and enjoy using the ad interaction and put that UI where people are doing the work. Don't force them to go over there and file it in a filing cabinet, bring it to where they're working. Um, Use a workspace approach so they don't have to go through an enormous taxonomy. And then last but not least, use the abilities of content services to extend into business applications, as I mentioned, where people are doing the work and contextualize the information so that the right information is being fed to the person at the right time. So second one is uh, think about applications. So um, we provide integrations, as I said, into leading systems, but we also have tools to build applications on our own, uh, like, for example, AppWorks, which is integrated uh, with uh, the, our content services, uh, no matter which platform uh, you're about to use. So think about what is it what you can provide to your end users in your departments, uh, really supporting them in the business. It's not just the platform technology, it is about solutions. We've demonstrated some and we have you know, more and more solutions in HR, in finance, in purchasing, but as you go back into your organization you know, and you have a content management platform from OpenText in place, what is it where you can actually help the business? What is it where you can embed them through the integration capabilities, where you can um, leverage what we as a standard solution provide, or where you can maybe even through, again, our low-code development environment, very quickly uh, create an application which is adding value to the business um, you know, in, a, in a very short time frame uh, with very little effort. Automation is the way out of the trouble that we find ourselves in, and I think in a lot of cases when it comes to success around content services. We just saw a fantastic example of that, of uh, the abilities of machine learning to take a lot of the, the grunt work out of the things that people just don't like doing when it comes to filing information, creating metadata. Take the opportunity to, to look at your business processes right now, and, and I can't emphasize this enough. Capture is different from what it was a few years ago, right? The, the advent of machine learning over top of Capture is completely changing the game again when it comes to Capture. It's not just capturing images anymore. It's not just OCR anymore. It's about the ability to understand the information and launch business processes. Upgrade. Upgrade is key for success, I would say. Um, we deliver a lot of new innovation on those platforms. Uh, you know, we've talked about smart UI, new user experiences. Uh, we you know, invested a lot in making upgrade much easier for you. Uh, we invested a lot in um, you know, reducing the total cost of ownership uh, for you. So once you get on you know, one of our current platforms, you can actually benefit uh, from a lot of these innovations. I know many of you are not yet. Uh, and we would rather, uh, you know, we would encourage you um, to look into upgrade and what's possible there. And um, for example, um, you know, extended ECM for many of you would also be another option on top of Content Suite, how to actually integrate into those applications, how to build more business solutions. There's a, there's a, there's a strong tool set which enables you to, you know, extend what you have done already. So upgrade is key. Uh, to leverage those benefits, upgrade is key to you know have a, you know easier upgrades in the future. As we changed a lot of those uh, tools and a lot of those mechanisms, how you actually have to run through that, um, and from there, once you, for example, are on 16 for Content Suite, you can really, through continuous updates, then benefit from a lot of the innovation we provide much easier than it ever was before. So, Michael, you you, you touched on something kind of near and dear to our hearts as well, which is. Extended ECM and this idea of the workspace and the ability to extend workspaces into lead applications. If you are today a Documentum customer, or if today you are just a content server customer not using extended ECM, I really encourage going out on the showroom floor and exploring and trying to understand a little bit more about the workspaces and about our ability to extend content. So we don't know if you noticed, but we made a very big announcement really around Documentum and the idea that we're taking the same ability to extend into SAP as a starting point for us for 
um, capturing content in context of the business with Documentum as well. So it's not just about content server customers, we're taking this idea because it's so effective to Documentum as well. And the last thing for us to really talk about is, is how does this all pull together? How does this pull together with the strategy that Mark outlined? How does this pull together with the set strategy around cloud, microservices, et cetera, is that we really believe that organizations right now are at a point where they're beginning to embrace cloud. They're at the point where they're looking to potentially go to managed services. They're at a point where they're considering how are we going to build applications. From our perspective, our strategy is about making sure that we are uh, delivering on what we promised, which is making sure that we're investing in the, in the core capabilities of Documentum, Content Server, Extended ECM, and then we're creating applications that um, extend the capabilities of those, of those core platforms and embrace it entirely, right? So we are here right now to deliver a strategy that makes sure that you're leveraging existing investments. I recommend that this is what this conference is about. And so thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thanks.